Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to be able to talk to you about the Cascabel uh, project. Very exciting project. I'll also talk a bit about Solgold um, and Ecuador. Um, there's a cautionary notice. Uh, you, can, you can access that on the website if you'd like to read that. Okay, so why Sol Gold? Well, Cascabel, we believe, is a world-class tier one copper gold discovery. I hope that uh, after this presentation you'll agree with me when I show you some of the, the slides and uh, an outstanding table of drill hole results that we have. Um, we're likely to have more metal, in fact, than many majors in their entire um, inventory. 30% of our drill holes are in the top 40 copper and gold porphyry um, drill holes ever drilled. So that's 10 holes which are close to one kilometre at 1% copper equivalent. Um, the company's recently been endorsed by Newcrest, who are uh, bought in at, um, they now own 14.45% of Solgold, and they're one of the world's top block cavers uh, globally. BHP also made an offer on us last year, a uh, failed attempt. Um, we're quite well resourced. Uh, we have a, a very strong technical team and board uh, with over 150 years porphyry experience. We have $64 million in cash in the bank. We're now drilling with five rigs. This will be increasing to 10 by the end of the year and um, targeting 9,000 metres per month. We started uh, recently using Devico directional drilling and this saves us a lot of time, uh, up to three weeks per drill hole and $350,000. We're very supportive Ecuadorian regulatory and fiscal framework. Uh, in 2012, when we went to Ecuador, we described it as a yellow light country. Uh, hope, hopefully it was going green, and that's uh, eventuated. Uh, it's uh, certainly a green light country now, and, and that's endorsed by many of the, the biggest miners in the world who are setting up offices and moving to Ecuador. We have feasibility studies, management planning underway. So if you look at a map of the world, if you want to find a porphyry copper, there's only so many places you can do so, and none better than the Andes. 48% uh, of the world's copper production comes from the Andes, and when we zoom in on that map, we see a hole over Ecuador where there's no mines. That's not because they're not there, it's because Ecuador was unexplored for a variety of reasons. Uh, this company was born in the Solomon Islands. We were called Solomon Gold. We spent many years exploring rugged jungle terrain in the Solomons, and in 2012, we made the move to a, a global search to, to look where we're going to find this big one. Um, thanks to then um, CEO Malcolm Norris and uh, Bruce Rulak, the GM of Exploration, they came up with Ecuador, and it's turned out very well for us. So zooming in on Ecuador now, you can see that Carnegie Ridge, that's a very important factor because it's a thick slab. As the, the plate passes over the Galapagos Islands hotspot, it forms a ridge of volcanoes. This makes a thick, buoyant oceanic slab, puts high copper and gold contents into the, into the melt. This low angle plate collision causes uplift that lets the metals distill slowly and distill into the melts. It also cracks the overlying volcanics, allowing the emplacement of the porphyry systems. Um, a lot of iron is introduced and that oxygen scavenges the iron and forms magnetite and leaves copper and gold to form the sulphides. Uh, magnetite is great because it allows, allows us to use uh, geophysics and geophysics has been really helpful um, in, in this discovery. Uh, the, it, we've dated this, it's Eocene age. We actually thought when we went there that we were looking at the Miocene belt, but we have an Eocene uh, belt here, which is great. The Miocene and the Eocene are the two most mineralised belts in Ecuador. So as you fly over Chile and Argentina, you look out the plane window, you can see the alteration systems. Not so in Ecuador. You have thick cloud, thick jungle. Not only that, up to 12 metres of mud before you can see what sort of alteration you have. So that's another reason why these things weren't found. That, um, our, our experience uh, working in the tropics has helped us to uh, operate in this sort of environment. And uh, recent developments in state-of-the-art geophysics has been a great, a great uh, tool for us. So here we have a, uh, an image. Uh, the vertical scale has the size in millions of tonnes. Uh, the horizontal scale is the age. You see the two belts, the um, Oligocene, Eocene, and the Miocene belt. The big blue blobs here, they're the Chilean porphyries. Yellow is the Peruvians, so Chile, number one copper producer in the world. 
Peru, number two, just north of that, you find Ecuador. And when we got there, there's only Hunin, or Jurimagua. It's in the Miocene, it's about a billion tonnes. We put Alpala Discovery about here. I think that's pretty conservative, but for the moment, what we've drilled so far, we're targeting about a billion tonnes. In, in brackets here, you see the grade of these deposits. So Chukikamata, the biggest, it's 0.65, 111 million tonnes of copper. I'd rather an Alteniente though, it's higher grade, 0.92 a little bit smaller. After some more exploration, we expect to see some big purple blobs Ecuador. We, we will really expect to see some more of those on this map. Okay, Ecuador is a mining friendly and constantly improving nation. They were, they're very politically stable and they've previously benefited from a, a GDP uh, strongly supported by oil revenues. When the oil price went down, uh, the, the economy started to suffer. But um, the Ecuadorian government has invested their oil revenues very wisely and responsibly. Uh, they've, there's decreased poverty. Um, they spend, have a huge public investment. About 15% of the GDP goes into public invest, investment, which is triple the Latin American average. And this uh, has resulted in outstanding infrastructure. I was really surprised when I got to Ecuador, and so is everybody else. You, first class roads. We're actually, we have a bitumen first-class road that goes right through the Cascabel concession. By far the easiest project I've worked on. I've never, uh, even in Australia, it's very rare to see a, a bitumen road go right through your mining lease. So that, that resulted in very good improvements to the, to the mining law. Ecuador needed to attract miners. They know that that's, they've missed the last boom and they're doing all they can to not miss the next one. Uh, the new um, president, uh, Lena Moreno, He's following in the, in the footsteps of his predecessor, um, Rafael Correa, in really promoting the mines industry. They've kept on the, uh, the first Minister of Mines, Javier Cordova. Pre prior to that, mining and energy were together, but two totally separate businesses. The Ecuadorians have, have sought a lot of uh, advice from companies and uh, consultancies such as Wood Mackenzie. They're doing all they can to attract investment. And um, they've, they've done this, they've improved the uh, the, the tax uh, regime, um, early year tax shields, um, import duty exemptions, VAT recovery, and they've made some improvements to the dreaded notorious windfall tax uh, that was uh, touted as a, the reason why Kinross left Ecuador. After them leaving, you see an influx of uh, new miners because they're currently improving the situation constantly. The windfall tax is now back in the, wind, in the Kinross days, it was all negotiable. Now it's, it follows a clear, transparent formula and um, the windfall tax will only kick in after full recuperation of your investment and only for very high commodity prices. So if we have 1,500 um, per ounce gold and $4 copper, the windfall tax may kick in, but I don't think we'll be complaining. <laughs> okay, um, many factors have gone into this discovery and none more important than the personnel involved, especially the board of directors. Uh, I've worked for these guys for many years, um, Robert Weinberg, John Bovard, Brian Moller, and Nick Mather. They all have a lot of skin in the game, especially Nick. And one thing I can say is that a lot of companies would never have found this prospect because they would never have drilled deep enough because they wouldn't have trusted their team on the ground. And that's what I see constantly from Sol Gold, that the directors trust the team on the ground and they take the risk. And without the risk, you're not going to get the reward. We have Steve Garwin. Uh, the best porphyry expert I've ever worked with. Uh, he's, he's teaching all the staff there, uh, us included. Fantastic porphyry guru. Ben and I have worked together for many years. This is the best project we've been involved with, but also it's the best project Steve's been involved with, and he's seen them all. <clears throat> so Solgold is listed on the AIM, Alternate Investment Market in the London Stock Exchange. We recently listed also on the TSX, we have about 1.5 billion shares on the market. You can see our, our new shareholding now, Newcrest bought in 14.5% of us, DGR Global, 13.5%. Cornerstone is our joint venture partner in Ecuador. They hold 10% of Sol Gold as well. Guyana Gold Fields, 68 And the Samuel Group, owned by Nick Mather, 5.9%. The endorsement from Newcrest, Guyana Gold, and BH Billiton, BHB Billiton, it made a big difference. It showed people that 
you know, this is something real. These guys, they don't buy into projects that aren't going to be tier ones. They're not interested. So um, let's look at the right side of the screen first. The Cascabel project is held by ENSA, Exploraciones Nova Min. ENSA, in turn, is 85% owned by Solgold, 15% owned by Cornerstone. We've only drilled 30 holes so far, but we, we know it's extremely rich. It's very large and still open in multiple directions, almost all directions, I would say. Not one of our holes has drilled outside the porphyry system. Every hole that's terminated has terminated in an intramineral intrusive, which suggests to me if you kept drilling, we could be still in it. We have no idea how big this thing could get because we haven't tested the edges of the system yet. And there's multiple targets. All our drill holes to date are right here in the Alpala cluster. So when we talk about Alpala, we're talking about this area down here. We have 15 porphyry targets within the Cascabel concession. We don't even know we've drilled the best of them yet. And as well as that, Solgold have now formed four new 100% owned subsidiaries in Ecuador, and we're targeting multiple targets all across the country. This country is vastly underexplored, and it's incredibly mineralized. Everywhere we look, we find copper sticking out of the ground. No historic systematic exploration at all. And these are some of the rocks we've got from um, some of the other projects. We have a bunch of them. There's over 20 porphyries at the moment, which we've identified about 2,500 kilometers of um, new ground granted, as well as that we also have some, some more applications. So here's a location map of Cascabel. This is one of the best things about it. It's uh, location. We're right, we have a, a main road going right through the concession. We're only 180 kilometers from the deep water port of Esmeraldas and San Lorenzo. There's abundant water supply. There's hydropower very close. Excellent local workforce. It's very easy to operate. Altitude. Um, th these, these advantages are going to save us billions when it comes to time to build this mine. We've worked it out up, up to $3 billion. If you look at um, some of the big porphyries in the Andes, Escondida, they're spending $3 billion just to pump water up there, desalt plant and pump water. So we have all that right there. The government's built it for us already. This is a map provided by Wood Mackenzie, just showing that the grades in uh, Ecuador are higher than the, the surrounding countries, generally, and power is much lower. It's uh, about eight, eight cents a uh, uh, gigawatt there. We put Cascabel up here somewhere, depending on the size of it. You want to go smaller tonnage, we'll be at the top. Bigger tonnage, well, the, the average of everything we've drilled, all our 40,000 metres, is 0.3 copper and 0.3 gold, including the waste. So here's um, a magnetic map. As I said, magnetics was super helpful. We have that great uh, magnetite, um, so beautiful correlation between magnetite and copper mineralisation. We started with airborne magnetics. We followed that up with 3D MVI magnetic modelling, IP survey over 30 Ks. Uh, this is the ground magnetic survey which overlies the airborne magnetics just to, to really help um, identify our um, mag targets. And uh, we're currently doing another Orion Spartan hybrid 3D IP survey and we have LiDAR survey planned. Uh, we've taken over 6,000 soil samples, analysed them for 48 elements. And uh, here's some of the most useful data sets. Manganese is very useful. The holes in the manganese identify the, the feldspar destructive alteration, which identifies the lithocap. They correlate. Here's molybdenum. So booming big highs here at Tandayama, Aganaga. No drill holes in those yet. The Alpala cluster is where we started because we had outcropping porphyry. And here's copper over zinc, another, another good uh, data set. So 15 porphyry targets there, of which we've drilled, we can say three now. Alpala Northwest, Alpala Central, and we're just moving to Alpala Southeast. When we overlay all these, this is how we uh, come up with our drill holes. So th there's magnetic structures, topo structures, electrical survey structures. We've done anaconda mapping up all the creeks. So we, we overlay the sulphide abundances, the B veins, and that's how we target our drill holes. We've drilled all the holes using a small man portable rig, so very small environmental footprint. We just 
set it up under the, under the canopy, no clearing involved. We've carried this over the mountain to drill all these holes. Up to 2,300 metres is the deepest drill hole with a man portable rig. That's a world record. Um, the previous world record was held by the same company, Hubbard Porforations, which was 1,000 metres. So we just keep breaking the world record for depth with a man portable rig on this job. Now this table, if you take one thing from this uh, presentation, I'd like you to take this. This is a list of the best drill holes in history that are publicly available. So we see at the top we have Los Sulfatos, Anglo-America's project in Chile. Under that we've put uh, Cadalco, Chilean Giants and Bingham Canyon, even though there's no reported grades uh, drill hole intersections. So we've put that up there. And then we go with, uh, in order, um, copper equivalent times metres. So these are ranked in order. Newcrest have a couple there at Wafi Golpu. And then all the ones in yellow are ours. So let's look at um, OU Tolgai, for example, hundreds of drill holes in it, if not thousands, they get two on the list, three on the list, sorry. Wafi Golpu, two on the list. Cascabel, Alpala Central, only 40 drill holes, 30 drill holes, and we have 10 on the list. So when we call this a tier one, I think, um, well, it's not just us saying it, obviously, now. We've, we've been endorsed. BHP don't make an offer on, on small projects. <coughs> so it has tier one potential in porphyries, high volume, long life, predictable cost, low capex. There's only been four tier ones discovered in the last 10 years. Here they are there. OK, go through some of the sections now. You can see this is the CN Tower, about 500 metres tall. Our high grade, we've got intersections consistently that big. This down the bottom is an intramineral dike, so it's, it's not necessarily the end of the system. It hasn't drilled out of the porphyry system into some barren basement. <clears throat> so it's, it's still open in pretty much all directions. Um, you can see the rock types. We, we get our best grades in, in the early quartz diorite here. I'll flick through some of these pretty fast because we're running out of time. Great correlation between geolog geology, um, our veining, this is our B vein percentage, and our copper equivalent shell. So we're getting a really good understanding of the geometry now, which is why each hole just keeps hitting. Uh, we like the southeast, southeast Alpala, we start to see more bornite. Bornite's important because it's a double the copper grade of chalcopyrite. So, you know, this, this was from hole 24, right down in the southeast, where we had our hottest clay temperature. We, we predicted that the, the guts of the system was going to be down there, and we're finding just that. So here's a uh, conceptual, well, here's a model. This is the new um, MVI magnetic modelling done from our mag. Hi. We can see here there's um, mag destruction on the top when you get your um, alteration. As you get into the mag high, it is a very good correlation between your copper grade and your mag. And none of these have been drilled yet, the surrounding ones. They're, they're, all, um, they're all geochemical highs and mag highs. Uh, we've got a lot more drilling to do. It's going to get a lot bigger. Here's a, a plan view of the same image. I'll go through a bit faster. OK, this is our shell, what we have at the moment, and our planned drilling to, to bring this into a resource. We hope uh, to drill, have 10 rigs on this and drill 90,000 metres in 2018. Here's a comparison with Golpu. Uh, Golpu in Papua New Guinea, Newcrest Mine um, a, a project. They've, uh, they're going to spend about $5 billion to develop this, this mine. In 2009, it looked like this. It was about 160 million tonnes. Seven years later, about 820 million tonnes. Here's El Palo Central at the same size and scale. So there's the 0.3 shell, there's their 0.3 shell. That tells you how much metal you can fit in a vertically extensive uh, system like this, with only relatively small, you know, plan view footprint. Although um, El Palo Central is only one of 15 within Cascabel. <clears throat> so you can see these really fit in the cost curve for a block, bay, a block cave mine. Here's some block cave projects that are going into development or in development already. The blue ones are operating mines. Here you see the cost curve, copper percent and gold, grams per tonne. Our intersections are off the scale. This gives us multiple options. We can start with an early high-grade underground mine. Um, many options there, and there's some of our, our best intersections and how they fit on this. 
Uh, here's our conceptual uh, decline. Uh, to topography really helps us here. We have a 900 metre advantage. So we're not like coming in from a flat desert plain. We just go into the side of the mountain. A six kilometre twin declines at a seven degree, degree angle will get us about two kilometres under the ground. From there, we can, we can drill it out from underground, block cave it, many options. <clears throat> So like I was saying before, the capex of this thing is going to be really helped by the, the current infrastructure. Here's some of the things we won't have to build. That's about $3 billion in saving. So this is just uh, preliminary uh, investigations, but we, we think we can get about 40 million tonnes per annum in a block cave mine. It's going to make a profit. And uh, that we're a very aggressive program coming up in the next few years bankable feasibility study within three years. So 2017, we'll have five to 10 rigs. 2018, we'll drill all year with, with 10 to 12 rigs. Feasibility by 2019 and development after 2020. Um, just a quick look at our, our new concessions. I'm really excited about these. Uh, over 2,500 uh, kilometers, square kilometers granted. I'm running out of time here, so uh, the Ecuadorian team is another great factor. Fantastic geologists over there, environmental scientists, a really great team. We have 97% Ecuador workforce. Obviously, when you're operating in a, a new mining culture, you have to be particularly concerned about health, safety, environment and community relations. And uh, we're used to, to doing uh, good work in that area. We have, um, we've given away over 350,000 trees that we've grown in our own nurseries. We employ the ladies in the village to do that. Coffee plantations, all the rest of it. We have an excellent safety record. So just topping up, why Sol Gold? Because Cascabel is tier one, world class. We're likely to have more metal than many majors have in their entire metal inventory. We've got 30% of the top 40 holes in history from only very limited drilling. We're endorsed by BHB, Newcrest, and we have a great team and we have money in the bank. <coughs> Radio, thank you very much. I think I've over overlaid the time. Yep.